How is the health status of a nation measured? Useful indicators are life expectancy and infant mortality. Average life expectancy in Canada today is nearly 79 years for women, more than 71 years for men, among the best in the world. Fewer than 1% of our babies die today. We have only to look back five decades to find a time when the rate of infant mortality was seven times that high. The health of Canadians has improved radically in the last century, but the progress has never been smooth, never uniform, never achieved without some public hostility and opposition. Time and time again, Science raced ahead, and the public lagged behind, refusing to accept help with the diseases and conditions that were killing it. Nor has that situation entirely changed. Research tells us today that smoking is hazardous, that fluoridation prevents cavities, that seat belts save lives. And yet, as a public, we smoke, resist fluoridation, and drive unprotected. Much has changed, but much remains the same. For four centuries, the pageant of Canadian history has been played out against a backdrop of disease. Never passive, disease acted as an obstacle, a deflector, a scythe cutting down one group to make way for another. In 1536, Jacques Cartier sailed up the St. Lawrence and wintered near modern-day Quebec. That winter, over a hundred of his men fell ill of mal de terre, or scurvy. With scurvy killing his crew, Cartier went to the Indians for help. They told him to drink a tea brewed from hemlock twigs and bark, but for 25 of Cartier's men, the cure came too late. France's every attempt to colonize this new land was made grindingly difficult by famine and scurvy. Roberval's colony in Quebec, Champlain's Ile saint croix off the coast of New Brunswick, small toeholds achieved at a great cost in lives, disease hampered the growth of New France in another way. To their Indian allies, the French swiftly imparted their diseases, measles, typhus, smallpox. The Iroquois, who hated the French, avoided these illnesses to some extent and were able, therefore, to defeat the disease-weakened Hurons. In the long battle for Canada, waged between France and England, the influence of disease favored one side and then the other. Finally, it was to the French that disease dealt a decisive blow. The ships that brought troops to fight for New France carried extra passengers, typhus and smallpox. Repeated epidemics in the colony and a very high death rate among the newborn shrank the population of New France and the army with it. When France was defeated by Britain on the Plains of Abraham in 1759, the French army numbered less than 10,000. Without smallpox and typhoid, their army would probably have been twice that size. The history of Canada could have been dramatically different. After Britain's conquest of New France, epidemics continued to reach the New World aboard crowded, unsanitary immigrant ships. They were called coffin ships for the mass death that happened aboard them. In 1832, news got out that 51,000 British immigrants were about to arrive in Quebec from cholera-infested ports. On Gros Isle, below Quebec City, a crude quarantine station was set up, and all the incoming ships were stopped, 
The human wastes from gross eel were dumped into the river, infecting the drinking water downstream. Not realizing that people could transmit illness when they appeared well, the keepers of the quarantine allowed healthy-looking immigrants to leave Gros Eel for Quebec and Montreal. A month and a half after the first ship arrived, cholera was raging in every settlement along Canada's river transportation system. The people burned tar in front of their houses in the vain hope that it would purify the air. When the quarantine failed, communities took steps to protect themselves. Club-wielding mobs tried to keep ships with cholera aboard from landing. Local boards of health also set out after the cholera menace. They suggested cleaning up polluted water and giving out free lime and whitewash for disinfecting cellars and privies. But politicians and the public both dragged their heels and the vicious contagion ran its course. In 1832, cholera killed one-tenth of the population of Quebec City. In Montreal, one-seventh of the population died. The immigration nightmare continued. In 1847, it was typhoid's turn. A hundred thousand immigrants left the British Isles for Canada and 20,000 died of typhus aboard the crowded coffin ships. The situation was even worse among the Plains Indians. In the 18th and 19th centuries, wave after wave of smallpox swept across Western Canada. Each epidemic destroyed at least half the Indian population of the West. Many Indians believed that the smallpox epidemics were part of a deliberate conspiracy to destroy them. They became increasingly hostile to the white man. But the smallpox epidemic of 1869 brought a sense that the scourge was too powerful to fight against. Anger gave way to hopelessness. The blind power of disease first aggravated, then repressed the spirit of rebellion among the Indians leaving the West generally pacified for settlement. Once again, disease had helped to forge the path that Canadian history followed. Most of history has been marked and marred by the futility of man's efforts against disease. But at the end of the 18th century, Edward Jenner injected cowpox into the arm of an eight-year-old boy and an unforeseen hope was at hand. Reverend John Clinch of Trinity, Newfoundland was a personal friend of Jenner. He received and used anti-smallpox vaccine perhaps as early as 1798. Dr. Joseph Bond introduced it to Nova Scotia in 1802. 1802, and yet Canadians continued to die of smallpox in large numbers for most of the following century. In 1861, Lower Canada passed an act making smallpox vaccination compulsory for everyone. Opposition to the act grew steadily, particularly in Quebec, where one doctor declared vaccination to be a useless, dangerous, and filthy right, an outrage against personal liberty. The situation reached crisis in 1885, when smallpox broke out in Montreal. After a week in which over 200 French Canadians had died in Montreal, the people took to the streets. Quarantine placards were torn down. The East End office of the Board of Health was destroyed. The mob broke into the health offices of City Hall, throwing disinfectants and posters out the windows. Finally, the mob marched to the home of the city's medical health officer, shouting threats of murder. 
the officer narrowly escaped out his back door. In the last six months of 1832, over 7,000 people died in the province of Quebec. In Ontario, where vaccination and quarantine had been practiced, only 21 deaths were attributed to the disease. Mass fatality proved to the Quebec public what argument and legislation could not. And 1885 was the last major smallpox epidemic in that province's history. A vigorous public health movement was gathering steam, making grinding progress against age-old hindrances, ignorance, indifference, hostility to change. Much of the battle for improved public health was fought in schools. Around the turn of the century, an attempt was made to keep children with infectious diseases out of school and quarantined. But some families concealed cases of diseases, like diphtheria, to avoid home quarantine or the isolation hospital. Pressure built for some kind of systematic medical inspection in the schools. But one medical officer in Toronto called the idea a pure fad instituted principally by women. From 1906 to 1914, most urban school systems did adopt medical inspection. A powerful force behind this change was the Canadian Public Health Association, formed in 1910. The association pushed for vaccination of school children against smallpox and for school medical inspections. From that time to this, the CPHA can be found behind practically every progressive change in Canadian public health. Another turn of the century health controversy concerned milk. Raw milk is a great carrier of disease. Typhoid, diphtheria, tuberculosis, to name just a few. Nevertheless, pasteurization was resisted by dairies, by the public, and even by doctors. A 1914 study concluded that 90% of Montreal's milk was unfit for human consumption. Compulsory pasteurization was recommended, but civic and public resistance did not give way until 1925. By 1927, Montreal milk was pasteurized, but a dairy worker carrying typhoid contaminated the pasteurized milk, touching off an epidemic in the city that killed 533. It was a grim reminder that health and sanitation laws are not enough. The rules are useless unless enforced. Canada's early immigration booms were periods of bad public health. This was again true when Canada embarked on its drive to populate the West after the turn of the century. It's not surprising that Winnipeg, the most populous western boom city, had the distinction in 1905 of having the most typhoid deaths of any major North American or European city. The Victorian Order of Nurses is perhaps best known for developing home nursing in Canada, but through its milk stations, child health clinics and prenatal classes it also imparted much knowledge of health hygiene to these new Canadians. In the 1880s, railway construction brought typhoid to central British Columbia. Mining and smelting towns like Caslow, Golden, Slocan, Sandon, Fernie and Trail were usually built on steep inclines with their open privy pits draining into watercourses that fed other villages downstream. The companies were unwilling to carry out improvements that might threaten their profits. When the economy boomed, typhoid boomed, a pattern lasting into the late 1930s, long after the disease had been eradicated in the rest of the country.
During World War I, few had cause to doubt the courage of Canada's soldiers. But many, for good reason, doubted their health. A scathing 1916 Canadian government report described the number of Canadians arriving in England medically unfit for service. When the troops returned, they brought with them venereal disease, tuberculosis, and Spanish influenza. In 1918, one out of six Canadians had the Spanish flu. Between 30 and 50,000 died. In Alberta, it was compulsory to wear masks outside the home. A poor protection, but the best available. In these images of victory parades in Alberta in 1918, we see joy over war's end and the almost cavalier pulling down of the masks, as if disease would somehow respect a day of celebration. The flu epidemic had one positive side effect. It made people feel the lack of a nationwide organization capable of handling such a health emergency. This led, in 1919, to the creation of a Federal Department of Health. The Roaring Twenties was a creative time, a time to put war behind and progress ahead. A perfect emblem of the era was the discovery of insulin by Canadians. When Frederick Banting and his colleagues injected an eight-year-old diabetic with insulin in 1922, saving his life, they were in fact saving the lives of millions of future diabetics, an achievement that won the 1923 Nobel Prize. Public health made considerable strides in the 1920s. In 1919, Dr. Gordon Bates organized the Canadian Social Hygiene Council dedicated to fighting venereal disease and all other preventable diseases. Later called the Health League of Canada, but still led by Dr. Bates, the organization published the magazine Health and played a powerful health advocacy role. In Prince Edward Island, Mona Wilson built her one nurse public health movement into a provincial department of health. She served the cause of public health in Prince Edward Island for 32 years, winning the highly respected and rarely awarded Florence Nightingale Medal for her efforts. Physician researcher Dr. Gordon Bell played that kind of central role in the development of public health in Manitoba, as did Dr. Henry S. N. Young in British Columbia. The Great Depression was a definite break in the progress of Canadian public health. Poverty and ill health go hand in hand. And during the 1930s, the health care system was burdened by people who were ill and could not pay for help. Economic recovery during World War II may have put an end to the Depression, but it didn't eradicate people's memories of how the poor had suffered in the 30s. Many wondered again if it was not time for some form of health insurance. It is not surprising that Saskatchewan, the province that suffered most under the combined scourge of drought and depression, was the first to pass a universal hospital insurance plan in 1947. By 1959, all the provinces were operating hospital insurance plans. In 1961, Saskatchewan was again the pioneer. Tommy Douglas's provincial government brought in universal health care insurance. The 1968 Federal Medical Care Act set the stage for insured health care across Canada. When Tommy Douglas legislated universal health care in 1961, he triggered a Saskatchewan doctor strike. If we could hear the arguments leveled by doctors then about excessive government control, we would have difficulty separating them from the arguments of present-day doctors against federal Medicare 
or in favor of extra billing. In a similar way, public opposition to health measures tends to appear in the same guise, generation after generation. Although Brantford, Ontario served to prove the effectiveness of fluoride against tooth decay, several communities still resist fluoridation of their drinking water on the grounds of the individual's right to choose and the fear of possible long-term health hazard. These arguments loudly echo the protests against chlorination that were heard in Vancouver during World War II. U.S. Navy ships would not take on Vancouver's unchlorinated water. Ottawa imposed chlorination, and a violent outcry resulted, not unlike the protests heard against smallpox in Quebec in 1885. Another echo of the past, and a truly terrible one, has been heard across Canada's north. In 1947 alone, 1% of all Northwest Territory natives perished of tuberculosis. Present-day infant mortality among the northern natives and Inuit is still two to three times higher than in the rest of Canada. But even that is a tremendous improvement over the past. Much credit for improvements in the north must go to Dr. Gordon Butler. In the 1960s, Dr. Butler traveled overland from Churchill to care for 2,000 scattered Inuit. Later, as the first director of Northern Health Services, he began to establish nursing stations in remote settlements. A sad fact about the North is that while infant mortality is down and communicable disease is under control, an epidemic of violent and accidental death remains. Despite the sad exceptions, public health in Canada is a success story. We have achieved near mastery over the diseases that were once our greatest fear. By 1979, smallpox had been eradicated worldwide. When an epidemic of polio hit Canada in the early 1950s, the reaction was swift and effective. Toronto's Connaught Laboratories, known to the world for its pioneer work in diphtheria control during the 1920s, now brought its expertise to bear on the problem of polio. The lab helped in the development of Salk polio vaccine, supplying most of the material for the Salk vaccine used in Canadian and American field trials. Salk vaccine was licensed in 1955, distributed free across Canada, and polio was quickly brought under control. Vast improvements like these have made Canada what might be called a net exporter of public health. Some of the individuals who have helped us reach that level have been mentioned already, but there are many more. Probably the most famous name in Canadian medicine is that of William Osler. Born in Ontario in 1849, Osler became an internationally admired teacher of medicine. He summarized his theories in the textbook, The Principles and Practice of Medicine, which has inspired generations of doctors. For Sir William Osler's achievement, we cannot look to a single discovery. Rather, he advanced the entire cause of medicine. Among those directly influenced by Osler was Dr. Maud Abbott, a world authority on congenital heart disease. Dr. Wilder Penfield also listed William Osler among his major influences. Wilder Penfield is known the world over for his work on the human mind. He contributed to the mapping of the brain and to our understanding of how thoughts are transmitted and stored. While Canadians, like Penfield, were taking their medical discoveries to the world, others were going abroad to apply their medical skills directly. Dr. Norman Bethune was a particularly restless medical traveler. During the Spanish Civil War, Bethune fought on the Loyalist side and set up a blood transfusion unit at the front. Later in China, 
Norman Bethune lent his medical skills to the communist forces of Mao Zedong. While operating in a Chinese peasant's hut, Bethune acquired an infection. He died. Medical missionary Dr. Robert McClure spent 25 years working in China. In the absence of medical licensing, McClure found that many of his helpers were going into medical practice. Rather than fight it, McClure turned it to his advantage, training them to practice effectively. Since his days in China, Dr. McClure has served in India, Palestine, Borneo, Zaire, and Peru. Another Canadian physician, Brock Chisholm, rose to one of the highest medical posts in the world. From 1948 to 1953, Dr. Chisholm was Director General of the World Health Organization. Thanks to people like these, Canada has attained an acceptable level of public health and a reputation as a contributor to world health. And yet there is much to do. The very technology that enabled us to improve our standards of public health has created a new generation of health problems. Pollution, stress, radiation, new problems, old problems, and the obstacles of public opposition, of vested interest, of simple inertia, seem to stand just as tall as ever between knowledge and effective prevention. Canada is a far healthier nation than it has ever been before. The new problems, the unconquered problems, are simply signs of how far we have yet to go. <laughs>